David Staples here from the Edmonton Journal. Today I'm talking to Judith Curry, um, who is a uh, climate scientist, and we're going to talk about a number of subjects related to that. Can we just start off, Pro Professor Curry, um, talking about your background as a climate scientist? If you could just go through um, the work that you've done in that area in, in just general terms. Okay, well, I got my PhD in 1982. My thesis was on. <laughs> clouds and sea ice in the Arctic, um, which in the subsequent decades turned out to be quite an important issue um, in the climate change debate. Um, I spent, I moved around to a number of different universities. Most recently, um, I was at Georgia Tech, where I was chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences for 13 years. Um, while at Georgia Tech, um, I was encouraged to start a company, um, which we named Climate Forecast Applications Network, and I now work full time for the company as its president. Where are you based now? Um, I'm in Reno, Nevada. Okay. So um, I understand in the sometime in the 2000s that you started to get a lot of media attention for some of the work that you did you did in climate change uh, research. What was that research? Uh, what was it? What, oh, what did you find at that time? OK, it was actually about hurricanes. I was co-author on a paper that examined the global hurricane data set, and we found that the percentage of category and five, four and five hurricanes had doubled since 1970. OK, and so we published this, but the timing was absolutely uncanny because it was published two weeks after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans. Okay. It gave us an outsized amount of media attention, and this um, sort of sucked me into the public debate on climate change. And at the time, I thought the responsible thing to do was to defend the IPCC consensus. So how much media attention did you get? What was it like in terms of... Oh, it was um, unbelievable. There were tele... You know, this was before Zoom and everything. There were television camera crews in and out of my office twice a day. And this is when, uh, you know, our 15 minutes turned into days, weeks, and months. I mean, it was just absolutely insane. Um, hurricanes became a, a focusing issue and Hurricane Katrina became a focusing event for the global warming debate because previously people said, oh, one degree, who cares? Okay, but then people saw, well, if one degree can cause, you know, more a larger number of these really strong hurricanes well then we better care and do something about it and and that was your that was your opinion at the time as well correct um or what did you think i, I was a little bit more moderate um i thought you know we didn't in our original paper we did not push the fossil fuel <laughs> warming link we said there's a link with increasing sea surface temperatures. I didn't push that. At the time, um, I wrote a few op-eds that I thought were fairly reasoned, you know, talking about the risk of warming and stuff like that. Um, but I, I was sort I was adopted by the activists, <laughs> so to speak. And as I got sucked into that more and more. I said, no, this is not right. You know, this is not, you know, so I backed off for a few years and, you know, just sort of. What troubled you about it? What, why did you back off? Um, well, I was concerned about how the IPCC had been handling uncertainty. And I was concerned about the activism of the scientists. Um, and not to mention the chairman of the IPCC at that time, Rachenda Pachari, and I said, no, this is politics driving science. <laughs> you know, this isn't the way it's supposed to work. And so I backed off. Um, and then. In why, why did you feel that way? What was what was going on, would you say? Oh, you, you would see these proclamations by scientists about doom and gloom and on and on and, you know, seeking media attention and some climate scientists even had um, publicity agents and, you know, on and on it went. I said, no, this isn't right. This isn't right. Um, you know, I was concerned about the uncertainties. There's a whole lot of things that we don't understand. And the way all this was 
portrayed in the IPCC reports, it was with too much confidence. When you started out in the climate field in the early 1980s, was it a very political field at that time or a high profile field? The field of climate science didn't even exist back then. You okay. know, there was geology, atmospheric science, oceanography. There were these fields that were hard science fields. Now you have climate studies and climate policy and climate this and climate that. And in all those sort of new majors, if you will, they get a very light dusting of real hardcore science and a heavy dose of science studies and policy and politics. So when you first went into it, it was just really. Um, it was, it was, I was an atmospheric scientist who also worked on sea ice, which sort of had one foot in the oceanography community. When you started out in those in those in the early 80s, mid 80s, did you see this as like an area that would explode into a, an area of great concern for all of humanity? Like an, a, a, as no. it's now framed an existential crisis? Did, you, did that ever cross your mind? No, even in the 1990s, and this is when the IPCC first started its work and its reports, it was fashionable in scientific circles to be skeptical of the IPCC and not like the idea of it. It was too political and so forth and so on. And certainly by the third assessment report, 2001, the one with the iconic hockey stick and everybody, and uh -huh. then it, it, it was, it, it was the powers that be in academic circles had sort of signed on to this. So it was becoming harder to be a scientist that was skeptical and questioning of this whole thing. I mean, all the grant announcements to get your research funding sort of assumed this implicitly. <laughs> so you had, you know, so, so it was a, an editor's People were starting to play, you know, the activists were starting to play games with editorial boards. So it was harder to get papers published in prestige journals. And so, you know, the academics who were interested in promoting their career jumped on board. Um, the academics who put personal and professional integrity first, you know, weren't so quick to do that. And they became marginalized. Tell me about the role of the IPCC in this then. What was what is their kind of model, this consensus model that they came up with, I understand, in the late 80s, early 90s? What is it and what are kind of the strengths and weaknesses of that approach to to um, describing uh, scientific findings? There's a big difference between a scientific consensus and a consensus of scientists. Nobody questions that the Earth orbits the sun. We don't even need to talk about a consensus about that piece of information. On the other hand, when there's a lot of uncertainties and disagreements, a group of scientists may be asked by politicians or whoever to come to agreement on something. And these people are probably already pre-selected <laughs> for a disposition towards a certain outcome preferred by the politicians. And so then you, these scientists then manufacture a consensus. Um, and this is pretty much how the IPCC has operated from the very beginning. The, I, I don't remember the exact, the IPCC shall endeavor to reach a consensus on all matters, blah, 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 blah. So it was codified into their approach. And for a highly uncertain <clears throat> and complex topic like climate change with big areas of ignorance, I mean, a consensus is pretty meaningless. We should have, you know, talked about the uncertainties and the range of different perspectives that scientists had. And, you know, portraying that kind of uncertainty to policymakers would have been very helpful in their decision making rather yes. than resulting in them thinking that this was a very simple issue. All scientists agree and there's only one thing that we can do. I mean, that was, I mean, a very misleading for the science and for the policy making. So it's had very detrimental effects all around. We've made some very big and bad mistakes in How, this past 20, 30 years in this. 
how would have been how, how would have if you had presented it the uncertainty model rather than the climate kind of climate change if you had focused on climate uncertainty and pre and presented that to the policymakers how would it have been different what, what like what would have been the well, major features of difference well the first assessment report actually did that the first yes. assessment report in 1990 was the way they should have kept doing it they talked about the uncertainties and what we didn't know and you know, there was, it, it, it was the way to do it. Um, and they should have just kept going on that. And they, they thought that they wrapped this whole thing around the precautionary principle. In 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, um, you know, the whole pre preventing dangerous anthropogenic climate change. And this was before there was any agreement that there was any kind of warming could discern from CO2. We already had all international treaties. Um, the UN FCCC treaty, which was signed by the United States even, was 1992 to prevent dangerous anthropogenic climate change. Come on, we had the policy cart way out in front of the scientific horse from the very beginning of this. What drove that, do you think? Like, have you, oh, okay. what do you think is driving the whole, this whole thing then? Okay, well, well this, you have to go back to the 1980s and the UN Environmental Program. Um, they had an agenda which was anti-capitalist, anti-fossil fuels, anti-industry. Their goal was non-governmental world control, and they keyed on climate change as an issue. So, so this was driven by a certain mindset um, in the UN Environmental Program back in the 1980s. And they were very successful in um, setting all this up. So it's a mindset of uh, government officials, UN officials, towards their own power, um, towards a certain model of the world ordered by UN officials. And um, did they essentially see climate as a very useful tool or stick oh, in order to... They keyed on climate change as the vehicle to do this because it's so amorphous, you know. There, there was a recent, oh, a couple years ago, I, uh, on the cover of Time magazine, climate is everything. I mean, people have tried to relate climate to everything, to yes. um, ridiculous things, ridiculous things. So um, it was a very useful vehicle for that kind of mindset. Well, because what they did relate it to was the use of fossil fuel, which is fundamental to our economy. And if you're dealing with something as big as energy systems, um, you can control a lot of the economy then if if that's what you're you're linking it to. Yeah. Now, this notion that 97% of climate scientists have a consensus um, that there is an existential crisis um, from about climate change based on um, the overuse of fossil fuels. Is there a consensus as 90 97% of climate okay. scientists on this, on, the, on that factor? If not, what what is the, what is the consensus? No, no, not at all. Um, okay, the original 97% paper arise from a group of young activists who uh, were surveying abstracts of scientific papers and try and they found that 97% of them either supported or accepted human-caused global warming. Okay. okay, they did survey scientists. I mean, there, the, the study was widely criticized, but it went viral when President Obama tweeted it. I see. And then the, 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 the study said nothing. They didn't interview scientists. The study had nothing to do with dangerous human-caused climate change. And nothing, and of course, nothing to do with an existential threat. So what we see here is consensus entrepreneurship, where you know, which President Obama did. He extended it not just to abstracts, but to scientists, and also into including dangerous. So this so-called consensus is amorphous, and you can extend it in any direction you want. What all scientists agree on is fairly limited. Um, that the temperatures have been increasing, humans emit carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has infrared emission spectra that helps warm the planet. Beyond that, 
the most consequential issues, there is significant disagreement as to what has caused the warming um, over the past century, um, what, what the climate of the 21st century looks like, whether warming is dangerous, and whether restricting fossil fuel usage is going to promote human well-being in the 21st century. All those other things are substantial disagreement about. But the consensus entrepreneurs have extended the consensus to cover everything. What are they, the, 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 what are the consensus entrepreneurs selling? What, what do they want us to buy? Oh, they, they want to, okay. Well, they want political power. And the interesting thing is that all this has caused a fracture in the environmental movement. The uh -huh. conventional environmental movement is fighting installation of wind farms, installation of solar farms, installation of transmission lines, and of course they're fighting nuclear power. Yes. Um, they also hate fossil fuels, you know, so, so there's a real conundrum for them. So, so this whole issue has fractured the environmental movement and the people who are pushing for wind and solar, um, you know, it's one thing to get rid of fossil fuels, but it's another thing to be so vehement about promoting wind and solar, which are very, very inferior sources of power, require a lot of resources, require a lot of land, they're intermittent, they're asynchronous, they don't last long, need to be replaced, you have to, going to be a tremendous amount of waste, and on and on it goes. There are huge disadvantages, environmental and economic disadvantages, not to mention um, major challenges to providing secure and inexpensive um, electricity. Places that have gone big in wind and solar have the most expensive electricity around. So it's not a cheaper way to go. The actual wind and wind and sunlight is cheap, but all the infrastructure is extremely expensive. And, and right now it needs to be backed up with fossil fuel plants because because of the intermittency issue. So let's go back now um, to um, your own change of heart in terms of being in the media and and your own research. Because I understand that at some point um, you question your own finding on hurricanes. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that, if that's correct. Okay. But when we published that paper, um, on hurricanes, people, hurricane experts went after us. I mean, the climate people loved it, but the hurricane experts went after us. They said the data isn't good enough in the 70s and 80s. And they also said there's a lot of natural climate variability. They also said a lot of other things that were stupider, but, but those two points uh, were quite valid. So rather than trying to cut down the people who disagreed with me, I listened to what they had to say. I wrote up a follow-on article, which was mixing uh, science and politics and testing the hypothesis that global warming is increasing hurricane intensity, et cetera. And I looked at the arguments um, that they did and looked at the pros and cons and came to the conclusion that, well, we, you know, certain things we don't know <laughs> because the data is inadequate and our understanding of natural variability is inadequate also. In the intervening time, I think the latest consensus is that rather than a doubling um, of category, the proportion of category four and five hurricanes, there's like a 13% increase for every degree of warming. I mean, that that's sort of the generally accepted number now. Um, again, it's, I still don't have a lot of confidence in that just because of the issue of natural climate variability. These big multi-decadal um, ocean circulations really have a big influence on hurricane activity. And we just don't have a long enough data record to really sort that out. So that, that's where we're at. But you know, it's certainly a possibility that with significant warming, we would actually notice an increase in the proportion of category fours and fives. I don't say the number, but the proportion, the numbers would stay the same. It would just, it's that we would see fewer of the weaker hurricanes. <laughs> so so the see. total 
Okay, so the to most climate models suggest that the total number of hurricanes would decrease, but the ones that we do get would be stronger. That that's okay. the latest thinking, but like I said, I don't have a lot of confidence in that. Still, how 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 going back, like let's say to the 1800s, do we know how many big hurricanes that we had? Uh, we have some records of landfalling hurricanes in the U.S. that are pretty good back into the 1800s. But the ones that are just floating out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, I mean, we really didn't see a lot of those until um, after World War II when they started reconnaissance flights. Um, there were also reconnaissance flights following World War II in the West Pacific Ocean. But in the rest of the oceans, especially the Southern Hemisphere, uh, we don't really have any good information until the satellite observations were up to snuff, and that's generally around 1980. Okay, so we don't have great data going back to track to even track. And this is one of the problems with your you're you're trying to say there's been a doubling, and then you realize, well, how can I say that if we really don't even know how many there were in the past? Is that essentially the the issue that came up? Uh, yeah. Okay. And when they presented that to you, you thought, oh, okay, okay, point taken. But if you look into it, you know, and, you know, the, the data quality, uh, you know, I've, I've had arguments. Some of them want to dismiss all of 1980s. I think it's fine from 1985 on, and it's borderline acceptable in the early 80s. I mean, there's still useful information there. So, you know, there's there's still a petty argument about, you know, that issue. But yeah, the 1970s, the data is definitely not up to snuff. Okay, so next time there's a big hurricane, or there's a big forest fire in California or where I'm from in British Columbia or Alberta, there's a massive forest fire. People are gonna say, and you can count on it, well, this is due to climate change. I see these stories every month. There's a there's a big weather event, and people say, well, this is related to climate change. Like in the in the popular media, they'll say this, and then everyone will repeat it, or many people will repeat it. When you see that kind of reporting going on in terms of fires or in terms of hurricanes or other major wet weather events, and you hear that those things being said, what what's your reaction to that? Well. You know, I roll my eyes, but but here's the issue for extreme weather events, unlike hurricanes in the middle of the Atlantic, we do have good records in North America back into the 1800s. OK, we know when there were wildfires, when there were heat waves, when there were big floods and on and on it goes. And. These so-called attribution studies might look back to 1950 to see, oh, this is the warmest since 1950 or there's some big trend. But like in the 1930s, okay, the weather and climate was horrendous in the 1940s. I mean, the biggest droughts, the biggest heat waves, the biggest hurricanes, and on and on, and biggest fires, you know, in the 1930s. Like the first half of the 20th century in North America really had worse weather than what we've seen in the last two decades. So, you know, with, with that context, it's very difficult to blame anything recent on global warming. And if you look at the paleoclimate record, um, you know, which can maybe take you back a thousand years, then you see some really <laughs> long periods of droughts and um, the atmospheric rivers that are currently a big issue in the U.S. West. We're getting these horrendous rainstorms coming in and snowstorms. Um, I think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Well, we had much, much worse back in the winter of 1861 and 1862, where the Central Valley of California was under 10 feet of water for months on end. And it turns out that using sediment core analysis, they were able to identify previous atmospheric river events, big ones, and it seems these happen every two, about every 200 years, and there have been much worse ones in the last thousand years. So once you look at the paleoclimate record, you know, even going back to the 18th or the 19th century, I mean, we're, we're in a period of pretty moderate weather. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, people complain about it, but, you know, think about all this in the 1930s. People didn't have air conditioning or air cleaners or, you know, all the things that they didn't have, things that protect us um, from from weather extremes. Um, so this is why, hence, this is why you roll your eyes. You're just thinking, they're saying this is climate change, but we had historically way worse weather events that yeah. we know can't be related to it's highly unlikely you know anthropogenic climate change like caused by fossil fuels because it just wasn't hadn't taken off to the extent that it is the carbon levels were much lower so you're just thinking are, are you thinking like this is nonsense or is it, it, it is nonsense not. is that it is okay uh, i mean it is nonsense um and and even if they could <clears throat> A trip, you know, for, for heat waves in some regions, it does seem to be related to the overall warming trend. But it doesn't mean that the heat wave wouldn't have occurred. It means that fossil fuels have maybe added one degree to the high temperature, you know. So okay. instead of um, 106 degrees, it might have been 105 degrees. Fair enough, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a difference, yeah. but it's not a, it's not a defining difference. So you, so at one point when your when your research first comes out, you're kind of the darling of the activist group, and and they you're getting swamped with attention because of this. Then you back off. What, what's it like when you start to present contrary arguments to the you know climate narrative? How are you then treated by um, the the media, by your colleagues, by research, by funders? <laughs> what changes for you when you start yeah. to enter the skeptical camp, skeptical okay, well, of the narrative? I have one very recent example. <sighs> Two days ago, I gave congressional testimony to the Senate Budget Committee on the topic of climate change and insurance risk. I gave my written testimony was very well reasoned, um, was very relevant to the topic. Um, and I don't think anybody could have objected to what I wrote or what I said in my remarks. In the questioning period, the chairman of the committee, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, went after me um, with all sorts of things, giving me 30 seconds to respond. Half the time I didn't know what he was talking about. He brought up an old 2007 op-ed, okay, from my days of writing about what we've talked about previously, he mischaracterized previous uh, congressional testimony that I gave, cherry pick things, uh, things out of context, and on and on it went. He, you know, went back and found little statements from old blog posts and interviews that he mischaracterized to make me look like some <clears throat> rampant idiot climate denier. And this was all part of. <clears throat> all part of the congressional record. He's posted a YouTube clip on it. Allegedly, <coughs> excuse me, allegedly they're going to give me a chance to reply as part of the congressional record. If they don't, um, I'll respond in a blog post. So that's how I get treated. Um, and if, if you want to know why the, you know, the climate issue is going nowhere in the U.S. and it's so inflammatory is because of behavior like this. Not looking at what I said, it, my actual testimony, which was quite constructive, but seeking to take down a favored witness of the Republicans in Congress. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So you're you're grilled and you're essentially demonized as a denier, you know, the no, it, 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 I, was, I was attacked without a chance to respond. Really? What went on. Oh, I was given 30. I didn't even know what he was talking about half the time. Give me 30 seconds. Oh, you'll have a chance to respond next. Well, well, where did that come from? You'll have a chance to respond next. You know, it, that, that's how it went pretty much. <laughs> U.S. politics at its finest. Have you ever um, had an experience like Professor uh, Lindzen with with um, censorship, where or or where one of your papers has been published and then the editor has been fired, or has that okay. ever happened? That I kind have of thing? to say, 
I was not aware. I, I know which papers that Dick Lindzen is talking about. Yeah. And they they are valued contributions to the scientific literature. I was unaware that editors were fired over those papers. I mean, people usually serve a three-year term as editor. So that's what he know, said. Yeah, you know, in a couple different uh, interviews. Editor actually said that I was fired over this. Uh, you know, I don't know what Dick okay, Lindsay basing that inference on. So I don't know. The Climate Gate emails, um, if you know what those are, these were the unauthorized emails about 2009. They hacked into the University of East Anglia. And there were many instances in there of scientists trying to conspire to get rid of editors who let skeptical papers through. So it wouldn't entirely surprise me that this was done for Lindzen's papers. It's just that this is the first time I've heard about that. Okay. So just tell, if, for people who are unfamiliar with Climate Gate, the University of East Anglia is uh, a, a key place, a key university in the climate um, studies? Yes, yeah, the, the Climatic Research Unit. Um, they, they were the lead people on a lot of the paleoclimate hockey stick and the surface temperature data sets that the UK produced. So they were a hotbed. A lot of people there were lead authors for the IPCC and so on. So those emails were a really insightful trove of what was going on behind the scenes. So they were kind of power brokers in the climate narrative, so to speak. Is that yep. a fair comment? Okay. Sure. And what what were they doing exactly? What were the, what was the, what were what were they trying to do? Oh, well, they were sabotaging Freedom of Information Act requests, people trying to get their data. Um, they were um, trying to sabotage the peer review of journal articles. They were getting rid of undesirable editors. You know, on and on it goes. It was behavior that was <laughs> unethical. How are we supposed? How are we supposed to trust if you're just a citizen trying to make sense of this, and you're seeing these IPCs, IPCC reports? And I just read the, the you know, the executive summary of the last one, and it's full of fairly alarming statements about what's going to happen and about the need for radical, you know, dramatic change, as they put it. How are we supposed to trust the, those documents, oh. knowing that there's been this kind of um, this kind of process, which is so laden with censorship and bullying. Okay, the, the, I'm, I'm in the process, and it's on my screen right now, of writing an op-ed about this. This is for the Australian. Um, I do a lot of op-eds <laughs> for Australian um, media. They, they seem to like what I have to say. Um, this is pure politics. I mean, that summary for policymaker is pure politics. It's a synthesis report of the three recent uh, reports from the six assessment report plus three special reports. And they focus. I mean, there's a couple of good reports in there. Um, you know, the hard physical science ones are certainly more credible and objective, but they chose to focus on the impacts reports and the mitigation reports. The impacts report um, uses the discredited emissions scenario, the extreme emissions scenario, 8.5, which even the Conference of Parties to the UN Agreement is no longer using, but they use it in this IPCC report to um, demonstrate alarming impacts. And then the mitigation chapter is pure politics, um, focused on um, you know, overconfidence in carbon budgets and explicitly advocating for wind and solar. I mean, it's just absolutely pointless. I mean, it, it's the, the IPCC has gone way beyond its remit in um, this kind of advocacy, but more worrisome is the misinformation being put, put forward by the um, st continuing to use that extreme emissions scenario. Uh, they mention it in a foot, footnote. I can read it. I have it right, right here on my desktop. This is hidden in a footnote. Very high emissions scenarios have become less likely but cannot be ruled out. And they use this as a defense for focusing on those scenarios in their impacts statement. So they still do, they still focus on the um, the most extreme yep. modeling scenario. That that's still yep. what they're basing their, their comment that we need 
um, uh, dramatic transformation of the economy, essentially, in in, okay. in short order. There's there's still they haven't backed off from that that, that focus. No. no, the irony is that the UN Conference of Parties has backed off. Um, in the COP26, which was in 2021, they dropped that scenario from consideration. Yes. And also in the COP27 in 2022, they are no longer using that. They're using the moderate emission scenario, RCP 4.5 is the baseline. I see. So, so. You know, so the IPCC has lost the plot. I mean, they did all this work. In all honesty, they started on this five or six years ago, you know, before we had such great, you know, before this RCP 8.5 became an issue. So they did all this work, but for the synthesis and assessment report, for them to emphasize the results using those extreme emission scenario is frankly misinformation. And, and so, for people unfamiliar with these, my understanding is that the the more uh, the more extreme modeling suggests that the temperature by the end of the century will go up by four to six degrees, and and the more moderate one is about about two to four degrees, correct? Two to three, two to three two, degrees. Yeah, the, two to three degrees more moderate, and then go ahead. Yeah, conference of parties is working off of a number of two point five degrees centigrade, and one point two of this has already occurred. So we're talking about an additional maybe um, 1.3 degrees centigrade over the remainder of the um, 20th century. And this is if you believe the IPCC. I still think that's too high <laughs> because they're they're not including um, the lower sensitivity end of the sp spectrum, and they're also not including plausible scenarios of natural climate variability. So personally, I think it'll be less than 1.3 degrees for the remainder of the 20th century. But 1.3 degrees just is not all that alarming or dangerous. And in order to keep amping up the alarm, um, you know, they need to use this RCP 8.5 scenario. I have no idea what they're gonna do for the next assessment report, which I guess is out, is due in 2030. So I guess it gives some time to figure out how to handle this thing. But, you know, the IPCC reports are really becoming less and less relevant, even to the conference of the parties um, to the UN agreement. So this is just utter craziness. So um, w one of the critiques I've, I've heard of them is that you know they do push certain solutions such as solar and wind but they they have they 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 do not mention nuclear power which has been a major source of uh low carbon no carbon energy in countries like france and jurisdictions like ontario for for decades um and has it has been responsible for far fewer emissions if emissions are the problem nuclear seems to be the answer in countries like france and ontario but the the IPCC doesn't even mention it. What is going on with that? Well, you know, there, there's a long history there. Um, back in the 1970s, when we had all the oil embargoes in the Middle East and we had the shortage of energy, um, both the nuclear and the coal people jumped on board. Okay, this is our big opportunity. Yes. You know, petroleum stuff is too... You know, there's too much geopolitics, you know, coal and nuclear. And so coal and nuclear were competing with each other. Um, and both of them got knocked down, coal for CO2 and nuclear for, you know, proliferation, storage, environmental, and all this kind of stuff, and safety. Well, nuclear is by far and away the safest power source in terms of number of deaths and environmental impacts, <clears throat> it's far and away the safest. It would be the easiest to make the transition because you can just put the plants where we currently have coal plants and take advantage of all the existing transmission structure. So nuclear is the obvious solution. In the US, the regulatory and permitting is so bad that it takes, they're horrendously expensive and take decades um, to build, but everybody else in the world is doing it far less expensively and, you know, completing them in eight years. So I don't know. Strangled but, by red tape in the United States then. Yeah. The, and okay. 
Yeah, so so this obsession with wind and solar, I mean, it, it, it's, we're going to come to a reckoning pretty soon because it's just not going to work. I mean, it's just not going to work. In the U.S., there's all these projects in the pipeline and they can't get approved because of land use issues that people say, no, not in my backyard. You know, this isn't happening. You know, people who own the land don't want it there. It's going to degrade the value of the land. Um, and then... <clears throat> Nobody's really done the stress testing. That there are so many problems and engineering challenges to overcome with a, a grid that's dominated by wind and solar power. We're just not there. We're just not there yet, and it's not clear that we can ever be there. Um, and if we do, I mean, we're going to have the, you know, when I look ahead to the year 2100, of course, I'll be in my grave for at least 50 years by then. Um, but to the extent that I can look down on all this in the year 2100, I don't expect to see all these wind and solar and transmission lines everywhere. I mean, I'm sure it will be geothermal, nuclear power, hydropower where it's available um, with conceivably um, some backup burners using coal or, or oil for extremely cold events you know, where you can store fuel on site. I, I think that even if we do go with nuclear, it's too expensive to oops, have, you know, power plants to cover every conceivable extreme. Yeah. I still think there will be a need for um, the extreme con conditions, you know, the, I forget what they call them, but the, the backup burners. Um, coal or oil. Natural, ga natural gas is fine if it can be stored on site, like liquid natural gas. But we've seen in some of these cold events, the transmission lines freeze up and the natural gas supply gets compromised. So natural gas isn't such a help in those extreme cold events. And people say, well, with warming, you know, the global warming, these cold events should go away. Well, they haven't been. Okay, even so far in the first two decades of the 21st century, we've still been setting cold records in the U.S. <laughs> um, if you do uh, natural gas right, I'm in Alberta, Canada, and if it's done right, you, it, it does work very well in extreme cold. You just, you know, I think they bury the lines. To, to, you have to bury, you can't, like, in Texas, they had a problem because that wasn't done. Like, yeah. nuclear didn't even run that well in Texas because I think a pump froze during that big uh, weather event there. So it all has to do with what you're expecting what you're expecting and what you've built for but natural gas can work in extreme cold because it works here just fine yeah. yeah um so the um prophecies of doom that we that we hear um you know that if we don't change change by 2030 we're sunk or if we don't change in the next few years we're sunk and you know you know the kind of the greta thunberg um model of <laughs> looking at the future when you when you see that what do you think when you hear those kinds of statements what do you think um well when i hear them from children i'm concerned in a different way when i hear them from journalists i figure out well they, you know these guys got to make a living this is how they sell their stories but um scientists even activists like michael mann push back against the doomsters, as he calls them. You know, he says climate doomism um, is as detrimental to action as is denial. So even a lot of the more mature activists, but a lot of these things like, you know, extinction rebellion and just stop oil, a lot of these are, they're driven by big money from um, like from the Getty, oil fortune, the Rockefellers, even one of the Kennedys is donating to this stuff. What the heck is going on in their minds? I have no idea. Okay, but the kids involved are being exploited. Okay, the, 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 market, the marketing of all this to kids is much more alarming than what we see, you know, in the legacy and mainstream media and Twitter, or wherever you go for your information. The kids are getting it way worse. Like there's this book, like Greta Thunberg's World, is aimed at three and eight years old. Has a quote in there, something like, Greta asks, why should I go to school when we're all doomed, you know, on a time scale of, you know, 10 years or something like that. And this is the stuff that's fed to 
you know, kids, you know, preschool and primary school kids. And so if we, you know, and so the kids get freaked out. You know, back when I was a kid, growing up in the 50s and early 60s, the issue was the communists taking over and nuclear war nuclear war and bomb bomb shelters and all this stuff you know and i i get how you know kids can get very freaked out about that and back in the 1950s it was a little bit more of a real threat than you know the climate stuff that the kids are being fed right now um it, it it's a very bad situation um and it's just I think people that the you know it's it's just the chicken little. I think people are getting tired of the alarm. Okay, you know the, the everyday person they want to know that their property is insured against some sort of crazy extreme weather event. They want to be reassured that they're going to have power uh, when it's very cold or or very hot, and that if like a hurricane or a bad windstorm or something comes through, that their power will be restored quickly. Um, they need better advice about where to live in terms of, you know, maybe it's not such a great thing to live on floodplains, river floodplains. The people who live on the coast, you know, they have all sorts of other motives for living there. I mean, my, my sister lives in Fort Myers Beach. This is one of the islands that got wiped out in Hurricane Ian, you know, and her condo was damaged, but you know, certainly not totally destroyed and she can't wait to get back there. <laughs> okay. And she plans on moving back there in September. You know, the value that people have, you know, she has a minimum of possessions and she says, you know, if they get wiped out, I just buy some more, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, people who love living on the coast are going to live there as long as they can. And, you know, the challenge is to either build structures that are sufficiently um, strong that they can withstand those storms or to build something that's really, really cheap that you don't expect to last more than 20 years. And if it gets blown down, you build it again. You haven't lost much money and you build it again. So people need to figure out how to adapt. But people are going to live on the coast you know, as long as they possibly can, even as the coast gets redefined. And so we need to figure out how to confront that. But, and the other thing, people in the U.S. are moving south. Okay, New York is losing population. Illinois is losing population. That population is going to Texas, Arizona, and Florida. And these are very warm states. So people don't like cold winters. So people just aren't seeing global warming as a problem in terms of their everyday lives. What would you say then to young people about what the next 30, 40, 50, like their lives are like the climate's going to be in their lifetimes, you know, to the end of the century? What are you, what's your best estimate or in terms of what they're going to face in terms of climate challenge and climate uncertainty and climate change? What would you tell them? Um, is what okay. the, you know, the best science says about what we can expect. Okay. The climate over the next few decades, say the 1950 or 2050, is going to, you know, warm probably at a slower rate than we've seen because of natural climate variability. In the second half of the century, we may see a, another warming bump as the ocean circulations get into a configuration where it's more um, conducive to overall warming, but overall. I, I would say, you know, another one to one and a half degrees centigrade of warming over the course of the 21st century is probably the upper end of what we can expect to see. And this this is something that we can is slow creep. We can slowly normalize what we're doing. I mean, in in the past 50 years, the num globally, you know, the number of deaths and property loss when scaled by GDP to extreme weather has dropped by a factor of five or six times. Incredibly sharp drops. And most of this has happened, you know, in the countries that are less developed. 
there used to be a lot of loss of life from hurricanes, like in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, Myanmar, and so on. Um, but now with better warming, warming, I mean, the losses number in the thousands, not in the hundreds of thousands. So, you know, we're making great progress in adapting. Um, and with, I mean, one of the keys to being able to adapt is to have inexpensive and reliable electricity and to have wealth. So anything that is going to jeopardize our electricity supplies, like these crazy wind and solar plants, is going to um, impact our security and also Im adversely impact our wealth. So right now we're going down the wrong path. But my message to the young people is one of technical optimism. I mean, we're living in the best time ever to be on this planet, okay? And we're we're and and every generation has its bogeymen that turn out, you know, not to really be such a big deal. And your generation's bogeyman is global warming. So, you know, be part of the solution in terms of your ideas, your energy. Um, your entrepreneurship can help us um, move forward into the 21st century with um, new ideas, new technologies, new ways to adapt, new ways to design cities and our infrastructure and so on. So, you know, I'm tremendously optimistic about the future, um, assuming that our politicians don't manage to destroy our energy infrastructure. To me, that's the biggest risk we're facing right now. That in the name of climate change, we'll destroy our energy inf infrastructure and then be unable to handle whatever climate uncertainty okay. does come our way. Yeah, yeah I'm the, heartened the worst, that, go yeah, ahead. The worst scenario is, let's say they're apocalyptic. Um, predictions turn out to be true. <clears throat> be in the worst position possible if we have an inadequate energy infrastructure to face these challenges. So the whole thing makes no sense. I'm heartened that a, a political leader like um, AOC now has become um, essentially embracing nuclear power and pushing it. I mean, I, I think that's the most hopeful sign that I've seen in a long time, that someone um, who typically is in a party and in a movement that that um, completely embraces the climate narrative and also completely embraces the solar wind narrative in, in terms of a solution, um, is seems to be backing away from that to, towards a more reasonable place. So um, that gives, that's what give that's the one thing that's given me um, a lot of hope um, in terms of that people can be persuaded that this younger generation doesn't have the baggage about nuclear power that, that older people, right. some older people seem to have. And, when they're looking for solutions, if they come at it with the open mind and a fresh perspective, we'll think maybe nuclear is the answer and maybe that's the direction we should push. So if I'm fearful about climate change, maybe I'll become a nuclear physicist. Or, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's my take on it. And that, that's what I would tell them is that, you know, leaders of your generation are waking up that there is a solution, even if it even if it is the most apocalyptic uh, situation. There's things we can do and let's just get after them. So good for sure. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me today. Is there any yeah. other thoughts that you have? Uh, you, yeah. you have your book. Just tell me just briefly, your book is coming out. When is it coming out and what does it cover? Okay. My book is called Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Um, it's coming out in early June. Um, basically, um, it talks about how we have all the politics, a lot of the issues, you know, when we're going through our interview, I could have said, that's chapter four, that's you. <laughs> the issues we've talked about are, are covered in the book. Um, it talks about how we came to be at this point where we're between a rock and a hard place, where we have all these apocalyptic warnings, but there's no solutions, and the ones that are put forward will just make things worse. Um, talk about um, climate models and how we should think about what the climate could look like. 
in the 21st century, some plausible worst cases and on and on it goes. And then the, the third part is really the part about risk and response, talks about how we've fundamentally mischaracterized climate risk and how we can better think about it. Um, over the past decade, I've been reading a lot of material on risk science and decision making under deep uncertainty. Apart from it being an academic interest, it's a key part of interacting with my clients in my company, Climate Forecast Applications Network. So that's become a central part of what I do now. And this last chapter explains how we should think about this. Um, there's a chapter on adaptation and also one on the energy transition, including the transition risk, <laughs> the risk we're facing as we transition to um, renewable weather and how we should think about this, evaluate this, and how we can reduce the transition risk. I'm all in favor of, of, of a, a better energy infrastructure for the 21st century, you know, clean, secure, reliable, abundant, and it can be green while we're at it. But if we only prioritize CO2 emissions, we're going to end up with a system that is not meeting any of those other criteria. So um, that's I, what I cover in the book. <laughs> I have one last that just popped something and popped in my head that I have, I have a question that I've been struggling with myself in, in regards to Alberta. As you, you may know that we have the Alberta oil sands, which is one of the huge stores of um, fossil fuels still in the ground in the world. And what they're planning to do is um, in production of, of the oil sands product, uh, bitumen, there's a lot of energy used to get it out of the ground and to process it. And um, currently um, natural gas is used to heat it up, heat up the ground and, and you know, run the factories anyway what they're what they're thinking of doing is um pumping a lot of the the um the carbon emissions that's used in the production of it into the ground they're going to spend 20 billion dollars on a pipeline and storage for carbon capture and storage and and um you know this would essentially uh decarbonize the oil sands production to a great extent and um you know it might help them sell their their oil under ESG pol policies, and I, and I had supported that, and then I just got to thinking, well, wouldn't maybe, wouldn't it be a better idea to build, put nuclear up there to replace the natural gas that's used and the other gas, just to replace, like, deal with the carbon that way, like, invest in better energy, a better energy system, um, that even so that even if climate doesn't turn out to be such a problem, at least you have then this great nuclear energy system helping you produce oil as opposed to pumping all of this carbon into the ground. Well, well, That's what is, I've been struggling with. What, and so what do you think about that? This is why I think the whole carbon capture and storage um, is a bad investment because if it turns out, if climate change turns out not to be a problem or people just on their own, you know, economically start going nuclear, then um, this in, that that money is sunk mm -hmm. literally into the ground without any benefit. I mean, you can score some political points right now by doing that, but in the long run, I think it's a terrible investment. Um, yeah, I think it's a bad investment. That's what I'm starting to think. I'm starting to wonder about that, and even. I don't even think the oil sands will be given credit by the environmentalists if they did that. They, they're still against oil anyway. They'll still fight yeah. oil. It doesn't. So if you're trying to win over people that way, it's that's not going to work. If you're trying to solve climate change that way, well, it's such a small amount of carbon compared to the new coal plants they're building in China, for instance. It makes no difference in the large scale anyway. I mean, and at, isn't there a better way to spend that money? Yeah, at some point, 50 years from now, if atmospheric CO2 really is such a big problem that we can adapt to, then by then we can figure out ways to suck it out of the air. But investing money right now, um, to me, that's just sending money into a hole in the ground. All right. Well, thanks for that. And thanks for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. Good well, luck thanks. with your book. Thank you.